Good evening. Oh, good evening. Okay, there we go. Well, it's good to be back at Fairhaven. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago when I was here, but I think it was um, probably in April when the last time I was here, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, good to see you all once again. And uh, Pastor Mitchell, thank you for the invitation to come. And uh, I certainly don't take it lightly. Thank you for the accommodations. And uh, my wife and I are, are thrilled to be here. Tammy, good to have you tonight. And uh, she's going to make a short trip of it. I've got to run her back to Grand Rapids tomorrow afternoon. And uh, she teaches fifth and sixth grade at our school. So it's hard to kind of be out of town and juggle both. But she said, if you really want me to come, she said, I can squeeze Sunday night and Monday morning in. I said, let's do it. So we made the drive this afternoon. She said, you really want to do this drive tomorrow? I said, I'm kind of stuck now. <laughs> really, I can't. There's no backing out now. So uh, praise the Lord for that. But I'm glad that she could be here. And uh, I need to say a few comments about Brother Ross as well. I just want to say I'm sorry for your sakes that he couldn't be here this week. So uh, um, when, I, when I got the call from Brother Mitchell, I, I, I didn't want to laugh because I understand the seriousness of the, of the situation. But uh, Brother Moody just spoke with me a few weeks ago. Brother Moody said, Pastor Crowley, he said, I have a, a marriage conference on, I think it's April the 5th. And he said, I've got it scheduled, had it scheduled. And he said, my speaker is uh, Brother Jerry Ross. And he said, he just called me last week and said he's not going to be able to come because of his cancer treatments that are taking place. He said, could you come and fill in for me? And I said, I'd be happy to. Then I get a call from Pastor Mitchell, and he said, uh, Brother, would you be able to fill in for us in a couple of weeks for our, our winter revival? He said, we had Brother Jerry Ross scheduled. He can't make it. And uh, I don't know if Brother Ross thinks I'm following his schedule and trying to fill up on his cancellations. I'm not sure, but uh, nothing could be further from the truth. So uh, you're probably as surprised to see me up here as I am surprised to see you this evening as well. So, but uh, I, I, I told the Lord years ago, I don't, I don't preach out a lot, maybe five or six times a year. And I'll be honest with you, that's perfect for me. I, I'm not looking for an itinerant ministry. Um, when God gives me an opportunity to step off from our pulpit and go somewhere else, I'm, I'm more than happy to go if I can be a help and a blessing. But uh, it, it humbles me. It honestly does that uh, somebody would, would call me and ask me to come. And so I try to put it into my schedule if it works out. I'm so glad to be here tonight. But uh, I do want to thank you all for coming up Friday night. And uh, Boy, the volleyball game was about as close as it comes. We went to the fifth game. I looked at the scoreboard. It was tied 13 to 13. And uh, I, I didn't know which way it was going to go. And, uh, and then the basketball team, I, my wife and I were in the concession stand. And uh, I wasn't paying attention to the score. And I looked at the scoreboard, and y'all were up 19 to 4. And I said, oh, not another one of these. I've, been, I've sat through a lot of these in the past. And uh, then I saw we caught up. And I'm like, what happened? Our guys finally woke up. And... Uh, so you, uh, you guys kind of put a fire in them. That's all I know. But, but, paybacks are costly. They'll be coming back in a couple weeks. So you have my permission to, to give them your best. And uh, if that means you beat them, then it probably will help them, maybe even humble them. So you have my permission. But uh, I don't know if you have their permission. We'll find out in a couple weeks. But uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Did I tell you where to turn your Bibles tonight? Turn it forward to Genesis chapter 12, if you would. Genesis chapter 12. Good to see some young men on the front row. Daniel, good to see you as well. We love Brother Mark Wagner. And uh, his mom was on the front row amening me on this morning. And uh, just a dear, dear family. Appreciate the Wagner family. So when you come to a place like Fairhaven Baptist Church, I, I know some of the men, obviously not all of the men that have preceded me behind this pulpit, but I know that you get fed very, very well. Week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. I remember sitting in this, in this auditorium and hearing some great evangelists preach and hearing some great pastors preach. And uh, the fact that I'm, I'm here tonight, I, I kind of feel like I'm out of place. But I'm, I just want to preach a couple thoughts that God laid on my heart in reference to Abram. Now, if I, if I accidentally call Abram Abraham, please forgive me. His name hasn't changed yet. We'll be basically in the chapters of 11, 12, and 13 of the book of Genesis. So if I refer to him as Abraham, please forgive me. It's Abram I'm referring to. I hope you'll allow me to mess up once in a while. But I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. So follow along as I read, if you would. Now, the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Can I stop here just for a minute? I don't want to get political tonight, but I hope the United States of America always is a friend to the Jewish nation. 
I always hope we are a friend to Israel. The day we aren't, follow that passage of Scripture, we're in trouble. Verse number four. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and all the souls that they had gotten in Haran. They went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, under the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. Heavenly Father, help us as we look into this passage of Scripture and a few others tonight. Give us good insight and discernment as to what your word would have for us. God, I pray that you would meet with us in a special way and may everything be said and done in a way that would bring all the honor and glory to you. I thank you for Pastor Mitchell, the great folks here at Fairhaven Baptist Church. God, I pray that you bless him in a special way. Be with us throughout the remainder of this meeting. I pray especially for Brother Ross this evening and as he will begin his cancer treatment soon if he hasn't already. God, I pray that you would touch his body and I thank you for how far you've brought him already and I pray that you would get him back to full health and strength and I pray that we would hear that this cancer is in remission. God, I pray that you would just intercede on his behalf and just bless him as only you can. I think of the armor cross tomorrow so I'll be heading for Myanmar and God, we've known them for many years and, and certainly they've been a dear part of this ministry for many, many years. Give them safety as they travel even this evening and tomorrow and God, use them to be a blessing to the people there. I know there's already prepared people for them and I pray that you'd use them in a great way to reach those people for you there. God bless our time together tonight. Thank you for bringing us here tonight. Give us safety, travel home and in the process, may you be the one that gets the honor and glory for all that's said and done. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you tonight just a few lessons on the life of Abram, if I could. I'm going to start in chapter number 11. If you look at verse number 31, the Bible says, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. I want to just give you five simple thoughts tonight. The first one is going to be Abraham's father. Easy thought, according to this passage of scripture, his father's name was Terah. Can you say Terah? Terah. Very good. You're a great audience. So we have Abraham's father. Abraham's father's name was Terah. You can stay right there in Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to come back to that. But I want to go to Joshua chapter 24. Read two verses there that Joshua, this is the last day of Joshua's life on this earth. He said in chapter 23, he said, this day I will go the way of all the earth. And, and this is the last message that he's delivering to the nation of Israel before he goes to heaven. And here's what he said in Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. I mentioned just a minute ago that Abraham had a father, and his father's name was Terah. There's one more fact I want you to learn about Abraham's father, Terah, is that Terah was an idol worshiper. The Bible said that he served other gods. You say, oh, Pastor Roe, that doesn't seem to line up with, with my thoughts, and it doesn't line up with my thoughts either. But here we see that Terah not only was the father of Abraham, but Terah was an idolater. He was a, a worshiper of false gods. Second thing I want to bring to your attention is Abram's faith. Look at chapter 12, if you would, in verse number 7. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Verse number eight, and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hay on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Look at chapter 13 and verse four. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. In chapter 13 and verse 18, then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Wow. Two chapters. Three times we find Abram building an altar, and then in chapter 13 and verse 4, he revisited one of the altars that he had built there between Bethel and Hai. 
Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying not only do I want to make, bring to your attention tonight Abraham's father, but I'd like to bring to your attention Abram's faith. He put his faith into practice. When we think of, of an altar, I, I think of the, the worship in the Old Testament times and how they would, would pr- pr- put sacrifices on an altar, and it was a place of, of worship. It was a place where they would offer those sacrifices, be it a, a sin offering or a trespass offering or, or be it a meat offering or a meal offering, be it a peace offering. And it was a place where, where the, the saints of the Old Testament went to do business with God. Church, can I say this? Don't ever forget that our worship of God always comes before our work for God. I think in my generation, Brother Ramos, we've gotten it confused and we think that what people see is in some cases more important than what God sees. Nothing could be further from the truth. Abraham hadn't, Abraham hadn't even started his work for God yet and we see three altars that he builds in these two chapters because Abram understood the importance of worship. Can I give you my third point? So my first point is Abram's father. My second point is Abram's faith. My third point is Abram's famine. Look at verse number 10 of chapter 12. There was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. I did a study on on famines years ago, and I, I was amazed at how many times the Bible mentions famine almost seemed to be somewhat of a, of a common occurrence back in those times. And so we, we see Abram's father, and his father's name was Terah, and Terah was an idol worshiper. Very good. Number two, we have Abram's faith, and Abram's faith was represented the fact that he, he built all of these altars, and on, on three different occasions he's built them, and on the fourth occasion he visited an altar. Then we come to a famine, and in the time of famine he went to Egypt. Now, I'm not here to debate whether he did what was right or not. I'm just saying this. I don't think famine's ever a place to go to unless God tells you to go go there. And it wasn't just what he took to Egypt, but even what he brought back that cost Abram probably more than he ever thought he would have to pay. So we see Abram's father, we see Abram's faith, we see Abram's famine. Now let's look at Abram's fear. Look at verse number 11. Came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. See, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's We'll get there in just a minute. But I want you to see Abram's fear. So we've got Abram's father, and his father's name was Terah, and Terah was an idol worshiper. We saw the fact after we we, we see Abram's uh, father, we see Abram's faith, and we see him building three altars and visiting one of the altars a, a second time. So four times the Bible mentions the altars there. We see this famine that he experienced in chapter 12 and verse 10. Then we see a fear that the famine kind of brought along as he went into Egypt. And then last but not least, I want you to see Abram's family in chapter 13. Let me start in verse number 7, chapter 13 and verse number 7. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, for me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. Get this next phrase. Like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. I wonder if one of the reasons that Lot chose this well-watered plain of Jordan is because when he looked at the, the nice, lush, green grass and he looked at the pastures and he said to himself, boy, that would be a good place for my cattle and for my flocks and my herds. And, and he looked and said to himself, it looks just like Egypt. Because the Bible says that Lot went to Egypt along with Abram. 
And what Abram didn't realize is not only was Egypt going to leave an influence in Abram's life, but it was going to leave an influence in Lot's life. Can I say this? Anytime we take a trip to Egypt, it's going to take your innocence and it's going to leave you with its influence. Here, Lot is just part of the clan. It's part of the family. Following Uncle Abram, and he goes to Egypt, and probably just an innocent bystander, but all of a sudden, he comes back out, and when he's given a choice, which direction to go, the right hand or the left hand, you take this side, I'll go the other way. And he lifted up his eyes, and he said, boy, that looks just like Egypt. And I remember those fields and the pasture, and it looked so enticing. And that was the choice that he made. So if I could, I'd like to take each one of these and just give you a lesson that we could, I believe, lean from this tonight. Let's start with Abraham's father. Abraham's father's name was Terah. Abraham's father was an idol worshiper. The Bible does not say anything at all about Abraham's mother. I can't find any reference to her whatsoever in our King James Bible. But obviously he had one, amen? Amen. Only one way you're going to be birthed into this world, and that's through your mother. And uh, so obviously, even though the Bible doesn't record one, we know that he certainly had one. But here's what I want to, my, my point tonight on Abraham's father is this, or Abraham's father is this. Abraham's father obviously didn't set the right example for him because he was an idol worshiper. So obviously he didn't set the right example for him, but here's what I appreciate about Abram. Abram didn't hold on to that and use that as an excuse. I don't see where Abram said, you know, God, I don't think I can obey you and I certainly can't follow you and I don't understand why you would put this blessing upon me and this curse upon others if they don't bless me. God, I don't know, understand why you do that. Don't you know that my father, Terah, was an idol worshiper? My father didn't have a faith in you. My father didn't have a, a, a salvation with you. He said, why is it that you would bless me? He wasn't looking to make an excuse simply because his dad didn't set the right example. We are living in a generation today, excuse me for saying this, but it seems like so many people are looking for an excuse and an opportunity to be a victim. And if we can find something to hang it on and find a reason, find an excuse, find an issue, it seems as if it validates our reason to say, well, that's the reason that I can't do something for God. And here God took this man, his name was Abram, his father Terah was an idol worshiper, Abram 75 years old, no doubt for most of his 75 years, he watched his father build his temples and build his altars to his false gods, but somewhere along the line, Abram said, that might be what my father chose to do, but that's not what I'm going to choose to do. If your father hasn't chosen to serve God, that's no reason for you not to choose to serve God. If your father hasn't set the right example for you, that's not an excuse for you not to do what God has placed on your heart to do. And I'm so glad that Abram did not use his father as an excuse. It would have been so easy for him to say, my father didn't serve God, my father served his false gods, I'm just gonna take the easy route, I'm gonna go with the direction that my dad went. But by the grace of God, there was something in the heart of Abram that said, just because my dad made some wrong choices, doesn't mean I have to make those same wrong choices. Abram's father. I want you to look at Abram's faith. He built this altar in chapter 12 and verse 7. Chapter 12 and verse 8. Chapter 13 and verse 4, he visited it. In chapter 13 and verse 18, he built another one. I was listening to a preacher the other day, and he made this comment, and it didn't sit very well with me. But he was talking about dispensationalism, and he said, he said, you do understand that people in different dispensations were saved in different ways. And I said, I have one problem with that. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Do, do you know how Abraham got saved? The same way we get saved. He believed God. According to James chapter 2 verse 23, as if one time wasn't enough for God to say it, but God says it again in James chapter 2 and verse 23. See, I'm sorry. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. See, Pastor Crow, when, when we're talking about the faith of Abraham, Pastor Crow, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that Abraham was a saved man, yet ironically, interestingly, Abraham was saved the same way we are. 
Somebody tries to come and tell you, and I heard a preacher say there were 13 different ways people got saved in the book of Acts. And I said, wow. You must be really smart to come up with that kind of stuff. I am so glad God never blessed me with one intellectual brain cell. And if you don't figure that out by tonight, by tomorrow night, you will. I, I'm, I'm just willing enough to say, if God said it, I believe it. I see one way people were saved in the book of Acts. I see one people, people were saved in the book of Genesis. I see one way people were saved in the entire Bible. But here's what I like about Abram. We can talk about Abram's father, but I would want to spend a few more minutes talking about Abram's faith. And here's what I believe was a pivotal point in Abram's life. If you look at chapter 12 and verse 7, just quickly, the Bible says, there builded he an altar. If you look at verse number 8, the Bible says, and there he builded an altar. In verse number 4 of chapter 13, under the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. Verse number 18 of chapter 13, he built there an altar unto the Lord. Church, I'm convinced the pivotal point in Abram's life was this. When Abram allowed his faith to become personal to him. He wasn't building, he wasn't worshiping on altars that other people had built. He was worshiping on altars that he had built because his faith was personal to him. It kind of reminds me of Ruth when she got ready to, to leave Moab and, and, and follow her, her mother-in-law Naomi to Bethlehem Judah and she made the statement to her she said your people will be my people and she said your God will be my God. You know what she said? She said I want to have a personal relationship with your God just as you do and she said I want your God to become my God. The difference that I believe that, that, that God began to, to work in Abram's life was this. Abram got to the point where he said, my father didn't have a faith to even pass down to me. My father didn't, I wasn't raised in a godly home. I wasn't raised with a godly heritage. My father is an idol worshiper. Bible mentions nothing about his mom. So perhaps she was a Christian, perhaps she wasn't. But the Bible doesn't say, so I'm just gonna go on this premises that maybe he never saw Christianity lived in, in his 75 years while he was growing up and while he was even a young man in that particular point in day and age. But here's what he did. When, when he accepted God and when he believed God, he made his faith personal. Young people, if you're nothing else I say tonight, don't miss this. One of the most crucial decisions that you'll ever make in this life is whether or not you take your faith and make it personal. What's going to make a difference in your life is when Fairhaven Baptist Church is not just the church you attend, it's not just the church your parents attend, it's not just the church where you're a member, but it's going to make a difference in your life the day that Fairhaven Baptist Church becomes your church. What's going to make a difference in your life is when this Bible is not just Pastor Mitchell's Bible and not just Brother Ramos' Bible and not, not just the staff's Bible and the faculty's Bible, but the day that this book becomes your book. What's going to make a difference in your life is when the standards and the areas of separation here aren't just the school standards and the college standards, but the day that you can walk up and down these aisles and they can get on your knees beside your bed and say, by the grace of God, I'm going to embrace them as my standards because they're founded and grounded in the word of God. I'm convinced that we have a lot of generational Christians today that are second generation Christians and third generation Christians and fourth generation Christians and we've spoon fed them and bottle fed them and we've raised them in church and we've, we, we've passed down a godly heritage to them and yes, there comes a point in time where they have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their own and they can't accept their, their, their parents God or their grandparents God. He has to become a personal God to them. But I've watched so many young people make a decision and I believe that they meant it when they got saved. But somewhere along the line it seems like it just never became theirs just never became personal to them God give us a generation of young men that'll say this isn't just my teacher standards it's not just my pastor's bible this is mine I believe that's what we're missing today boy we could have a bible drill tonight and these kids could find scriptures faster than most adults could we could have Bible trivia tonight and some of these young people could answer questions faster than most of the adults could. And we'd say, look at all this knowledge, look at all this talent, look at all this wisdom. But it'll be useless if it doesn't become personal. 
I think about Daniel, taken as a prisoner of war, along with probably several other thousands of young people out of Jerusalem, taken over 500 miles to Babylon. And I wonder if the talk wasn't, hey, whatever happens in Babylon stays in Babylon. Hey, we're not under our parents' reign anymore. Hey, there's no priest anymore. Hey, there's no synagogue to go to. Hey, those Jewish laws don't apply in Babylon anymore. But I'm so glad to know there was a young man by the name of Daniel that said, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Can I tell you the difference in Daniel's life? There might even be a song in your hymn book that says, dare to be a Daniel. Can I tell you why? Because there was a young man that said, it's not just my my parents faith Amen. it's my faith Amen. and all of a sudden here comes Shadrach and here comes Meshach and here comes Abednego and they said Daniel you're not alone there might be four of us against a few thousand but hey there's four of us that are willing to take a stand and we feel the same way you do Daniel and we have purpose in our heart just as well and we won't eat that that meat and we won't drink that wine we have made our faith personal just as well. It's not just how we were raised, and it's not just what our parents handed down to us. It's what God put in our hearts just as well. And not only is it their faith, but it's our faith. I think of Joseph in Genesis chapter 39. Potiphar's wife tried to wear him down day after day. She tried to get him to, to, to lay with her, and he said, no, no, I can't do this. And finally, in Genesis chapter 39, she had all the men out of the house, and she, she, one more time, she tried to get Joseph to, to, to give in to her will and way, and Joseph made this statement to her, and he said, ma'am, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You know what he said? I'm not just living off my father's faith, not just living off my grandfather's faith. I'm living off my faith. This is personal with me. My dad may never find out what I say, whether I say yes or no to you, ma'am, but there's one person who will, and that's my God. And I made a decision years ago that what God put in my heart, I was gonna follow through with. And I wasn't just gonna do this because this is the way I was raised. This is the way I was brought up. This just is the way it was supposed to be because I was, I was given a goodly and a godly heritage. He said, no, there was a day in my life where I made this personal. It's not just my father's faith, it's my faith. I think of David when he went to check on his brothers in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He was just going to deliver them some food and give some cheeses to some of those that were in charge of the army. He got there and he heard this Goliath, this giant Goliath, probably nine feet, nine inches tall and probably had as much armor as, as most of us would weigh in this auditorium tonight. And David looked at King Saul and he said, who's gonna go fight with him? And, and Saul said, well, certainly you can't, son. He said, this man, he's been a man of war from his youth and your buddy youth. And he said, if you're gonna go, you better at least put on my armor. And David put it on and Saul was head and shoulders above all the Israelites. So clearly it didn't fit him. And David said, sir, I haven't proved these. I can't go with these. All I need is my sling and all I need is my God. And he looked at the king and he, he said in so many words, is there not a cause? He said it to Eliab and he basically said it to, to King Saul. Hey, I can go out there. God is going to help us. God's going to win this battle. God is for Israel. God's not for the Philistines. Somebody just has to be willing to trust God and make their faith personal. You know what I like about Abram? I don't think he had a godly heritage. I don't think he was raised in a Christian home. And when God did a work in his heart, he said, I don't have an example to look at, but I'm not going to use that as an excuse. I'm going to let God do a work in my heart, and I want God to make it personal to me. Because there's going to come a day, my Bible says, when every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Can't hide behind my parents forever. I can't hide behind my grandparents forever. There's going to come a day when I'm going to give an account of what I did with my life to God. And church, here's what I like about Abraham. His father was an idol worshiper. But when he believed God, and God counted unto him for righteousness, Abram said, I'm going to start building altars in my salvation and with my, with my Christianity, with my new life in God, my new life in Christ. He said, I'm going to make this so personal that nobody's ever going to be able to say, oh, that's what your daddy put on your heart. Oh, that's what your mother put on your heart. No, that's what my heavenly father put in my heart. And he made it personal. Chapter 12, verse 10. There was a famine in the land. Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Church, can I say this? I, I, I'm convinced that God still sends famines in our day like he did in the Old Testament times. 
And when Abram faced this famine, yes, it was, it was a famine of, of food and maybe even a famine, maybe there was a, a shortage of water and there were some issues that he had and he had some flax and so he said, you know what, the best thing I can do is go to Egypt. They've got plenty of food there. Isn't that always seemingly the place where young people have a desire to go? Let's just go straight to the world. Egypt in the Bible is a picture of the world, and, and that's where Abraham went. And, and it would have been okay for Abraham to go there if the Bible would have said, and, and God said to Abraham, go to Egypt. Stay there until I call you back into the land of Canaan. I don't see that. I see Abraham taking this decision and making this decision, and he said, I'm, I'm just going to make the best decision I can. I've got a family to feed. I've got a large family to feed. I've got flocks to feed. I've got herds to feed. I've got to take matters into my own hands. We're going to go to Egypt. But things changed when he was in Egypt. Things changed in his life. Things changed in Lot's life. In chapter 16, when he took Hagar to be his wife, that maybe she might bear the promised son according to Sarai, the Bible says that she was a handmaiden from Egypt. And I just wonder if she was part of the cargo that came with him when he, when he left Egypt. He went just to get some food. I don't think he went with bad intentions. I don't think he had wrong, wrong thoughts in his mind when he decided to go there. But somehow, some way, he ends up with this, this, this Egyptian handmaid by the name of Hagar. And all of a sudden, in the Middle East to this day, we're still suffering because of that decision. All the way back in the book of Genesis. It was a famine. I was reading the other day in the book of Amos. The Bible says in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I don't know if I should say this or not, but I'm kind of a transparent kind of person. I think the first famine I remember going through was in 1999. I'd been at Beth Haven Baptist Church for three years, and, and somehow, Pastor Mitchell, I, I had convinced myself that three years into the ministry, everything was going to become just a, 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 a bed of roses. It was just going to be a piece of cake. If I could just get through these first three years of sermon preparation and pastoring, if I can just get a few years under my belt, by the time I get to year number three, I, I think it's just going to be smooth sailing. Had an office in my basement at our house, and I was studying on a Friday night. I had a Sunday school lesson to get ready. I had a Sunday morning message to get ready. I had a Sunday night message to get ready. And I was so frustrated because nothing was coming together. I'd been reading my Bible all week. I'd been studying all week. I'd been writing up outlines all week. I did get a little comfort when I read that uh, Charles Spurgeon said on one occasion that it wasn't uncommon for him to write up 10 messages in one week, only not to preach any one of them on Sunday. And I thought, Mr. Spurgeon, I've been there. I was studying that night, and nothing was coming together. And for whatever reason, I took my glasses off, and, and I'm pretty much blind without them. And I took my glasses off, and out of frustration, I took them and I threw them up against the wall. They broke in probably five or six pieces. And little did I know that my six-year-old daughter was sitting on the bottom step. Maddie didn't say a word. She walked over to the wall and she picked up every piece of the glasses that she could. She brought them over to me behind, sitting behind my desk. She took those little pieces of all that broken glass and plastic and she put them on my desk and she said, Daddy, why are you so angry? She just walked out of the room and walked up the stairs and went back upstairs. I started to cry and I said, God, I, I don't know why this has become so hard and so difficult. I thought when I surrendered to the ministry that preaching would come so easy and that you would just give me alliterated outlines every day of the week and I'd have more, more, more messages that I could ever preach in a lifetime. And I thought I'd have that within just a couple of years into the ministry. I said, God, why does it seem like I'm suffering through a famine right now? I'm reading your word, and I'm listening to your word, and I'm reading commentaries, and I'm doing everything I can, but it seems as if every time I go to the well, the well is dry. It seemed like God said, son, you're going through a famine. And I learned the hard way that a famine will do two things to you. 
It'll test your sincerity and it'll test your maturity. I had to go upstairs and I had to apologize to my daughter. I don't think she fully understood, but I tried my best. I came back downstairs and I said, God, I don't want to become an angry person. I don't want to become an angry father. And God is my witness from that day to this. On my daily prayer list, I ask God not to help me be an angry person. You see, Pastor Crow, that was almost 25 years ago. I know. And I wish I could tell you that was the last famine that I've had. They don't come very often. But oftentimes when I least expect it, I'll open the Bible, I'll start reading from it, I'll start putting thoughts on a piece of paper, and I couldn't tell you how many times on a Sunday morning, Pastor Mitchell, I've been driving to Beth Haven Baptist Church with nothing to preach. Begging God, send a missionary, send an evangelist, send somebody our way. I'll preach him in a heartbeat. We'll send him down, out of town to the love offering. God, please, please, please hear this prayer this morning. And every time I prayed that prayer, God's never answered it. Not once. I've scoured the crowd. Who's here with a suit and tie that I don't recognize? Who's there that I can call and preach for me this morning? And I've come to my office more times than I can imagine on a Sunday morning saying, God, I've got people that are expecting to hear from you in 90 minutes, and God, I have nothing to give them. And on more occasions than I can ever remember, the Holy Spirit has said, Son, just take your pen and paper and start writing. The famine is over. Here's your message for the day. So, Pastor Crow, what have you learned from that? And when you go through a famine, don't head to Egypt. When you go through a famine, it's not when you resign from the ministry. When you go through a famine, it's not when you allow those frustrations and those emotions and that anger to swell up inside of you so that it automatically comes and, and just ushers out at a time that you least expect it. You say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to rest in you. God, I'm just going to trust in you. God, these, these might be my sheep, but they're your people. I, I might be the one that's delivering the message today, but you care for them far more than I do. And God, I, I know that you know exactly what they need. I, I, I've pastored them for, for tw almost 28 years, but God, you know them in ways that I'll never know them. You know every ache and every heartache and every heartbreak. You know every issue they have and every need that they have. And God, I'm just depending on you because your word is gonna be declared in just a few moments. And all I'm asking, God, is give me something from your word to help your people this morning. Sometimes when it seems like the hour was almost upon us, the Holy Spirit said, start writing, son. Six weeks ago, I was in prison on a Sunday morning. I, I, I didn't break the law, please. I, 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 I think I enjoy preaching in prisons more than any other place. And we're on schedule to go to a different prison every Sunday. And I, I try to go at least two or three, sometimes four times. And I went to St. Louis this morning, go to prison. I forgot to take my wallet. They wouldn't let me in because I didn't have my license. And I was heartbroken. I absolutely love going to prison. And guy that went with me said there were 108 men there this morning. Pastor Crowley said, I'm sorry. He said, you missed a good service. I said, I know I did. And uh, I, just, I just love preaching in prison. I was in prison a few weeks ago. And I said, God, I said, here I am. It's 8.30. I've got to preach in two and a half hours. God, I've studied all week and I've got three outlines in my Bible. But I said, I don't believe any one of these outlines is the outline that you've got me to preach this morning. But I said, I just want you to know that I said, I've got the pen of a right ready scribe. And God, if you start laying some thoughts on my heart, I'll start writing it down right now. And while another gentleman in our church was preaching at a prison in Carson City, Michigan, the Holy Spirit said, son, you better start writing. And I started writing and I came up with an entire outline probably within the next 20 to 30 minutes. And I got up and preached it in just a little bit. And I had people come up to me and say, Pastor Carl, thank you for spending so much time with God this week and having the right message at the right time. I said, you don't even know. I've been begging God all week for the right message. I've been studying my Bible. I've been reading my commentaries. I've been doing everything I know what to do. I knocked on doors this week. I've tried to fulfill what God wanted me to do this week. He just sent another famine. We're now sitting in that person at 8.30 this morning. Holy Spirit said, son, just start writing. And when that message came through, I said, God, that's all I need. That's all I need. Pastor, what are you saying? 
I look in these pages of Scripture and I see Abram's father. His name was Terah. He was an idol worshiper. But Abram didn't use it as an excuse not to serve God. I look in my Bible and I see his faith and I see a faith that Abram made personal to him. He didn't try to push it off on anybody else. He said, no, this is real between me and God. And oh, if God would give us a generation of young people today to say, it's not just my parents' faith. It's not just my pastor's faith. It's not just my youth pastor's faith. This is my faith. And when you find yourself going through a famine, it's not time to quit. It's not time to drop a resignation letter. It's just time to pull up your bootstraps and say, by the grace of God, we're just going to see this through. On more than one occasion, I've said, God, I don't know what you're going to do on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, but I'm glad I'm going to be there to see what's going to happen. Shaking the whole way. Saying, God, what is there today? Oh, I'll be honest with you, I love it when on Sunday morning or Sunday, or Sunday afternoon, I already know what my next Sunday message is going to be. I love those weeks. But it doesn't always happen that way. And I think sometimes God just wants to see how sincere are you, Kevin? How mature are you? What are you going to do when the message doesn't come this, easy, this week? What are you going to do when, when everything doesn't fall in place the way that you want it to, in the timing that you want it to? Who are you going to trust and who are you going to depend on then? I see Abram's famine. Then I see his fear. Can I just remind you quickly, and I'll, I'll be done in just a few minutes. When Abram developed this fear, did you notice he wasn't afraid for his wife? He was afraid for himself. Now, wouldn't you think that the average man, I mean, aren't we supposed to be chivalrous? Aren't we supposed to protect our wives? Aren't we supposed to be more concerned for their safety than we are our own? Shouldn't we say, honey, I don't care what they, what they do to me, but I want to make sure that you're protected. No, no. He said, hey, honey, tell them you're my sister because they're going to be kind to you because you're pretty, but they're going to kill me. So let's just concoct this little lie. I mean, it was, okay, it was a half truth. They had the same father, the Bible tells us, but they didn't have the same mother. So they were, they were, they were half siblings, but I've been told that a half truth is still a whole lie. And so she went along with this, and guess what happened? They took her into Pharaoh's house, and they saved Abram alive, exactly what he said. But I'm thinking, he, he shouldn't have been relieved at that point. His wife was taken captive. Do you know what I found that fear does? Fear always puts the focus on us. Somebody said to me, they said, oh, you're preaching a fear even this week? They said, are you nervous? They said, are you afraid? And I said, I hope not. Overwhelmed, maybe, but, but not afraid. Because if I'm, if I'm afraid or nervous, that's because my focus is on me. The focus isn't on me. The focus is on God. The focus is on the word of God. We don't have time to worry about me. If, 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 if y'all say, oh, this Kevin Kroll guy, don't ever put him on the replacement list again. I, I'm okay with that. Believe me, my plate is full at Beth Haven Baptist Church, and I'm perfectly fine with that. But as long as I'm here, I have to preach what God's laid on my heart to preach. And church, can I say this? When Abraham began to fear, his focus was not about Sarai. His focus wasn't about her safety. It wasn't about her survival. It was all about himself. Is it any wonder the Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind? You know what I learned a long time ago? God never needs us to tell a lie to bail him out. When Rahab had those two spies on her roof and she said, oh, I'm not really sure where they are. She didn't need to lie for God. But she did. Oh, she said, they're gone. If you go take a journey up the mountains, you'll catch them. And uh, she told the man, she said, stay here for a couple days. When they come back, she said, I'll let you go. I know the end of the story turned out okay for her, but I'm just saying, God didn't need her to tell a lie. God doesn't need us to bail them out. God's greater than all. If Abraham just would have said, Abraham said, you know what, she's my wife. I know she's beautiful. She's my half-sister, but she's also my wife. If he just would have told the truth, I wonder how things would have turned out. And then he was given all these things because of, I guess, because of his wife. And I'm wondering, was Hagar one of those gifts he got? He'd have been better off without those gifts. That's what fear did. Last but not least, his family. Abraham and Sarah obviously had no children at this time. Lot was his nephew. Lot's father had passed away, and so I assume that Abram kind of took his father's place, and he kind of took Lot in as kind of a, maybe a, a child or maybe you know, part of the family, and so he was kind of taking care of him and felt responsible for him. Get to a point in, in verse number seven, there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and 
Verse 8, Abram said, let there be no strife, I pray thee. So I see there was contention there. Abram said in verse 9, he said, separate thyself. And so I see the contention and I see the separation. Then I see in verse number 10 that Lab lifted up his eyes and beheld all the, well, the plains of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like unto the land of Egypt, as so it comes unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Lot journeyed east. I see the contention. I see the separation. And then I see the relocation. But here's what saddens me. I don't see the supplication. I don't see where Lot built an altar. I don't see where Lot called on the name of the Lord like Abram had. I see Lot just choosing him based on what he could see. He said, you know, that looks like a good place for cattle. Kind of reminds me of Egypt. And Lot made a decision based on what he could see. Church, can I say this? One of the things I, I really don't like about life are all the choices and decisions that come our way. I would be perfectly fine if I never had to make another choice as long as I lived. Everything just fell into place and I didn't have to make any choices or decisions. But can I say this? You better make sure before you relocate your family that you've put some time in prayer, that you've made that decision in prayer and made sure, God, is this your will or is this my will? We had a family leave our church not long ago and they moved to another state. They made the comment to me before they left town. They said, Pastor, and I, and I said, do you all know what church you're going to go to? And they said, well, we haven't narrowed it down yet, but they said, Pastor, the area that we're going to, there is all kinds of good churches there. They said, Pastor, there are good churches everywhere. Know what I found, Brother Ramos? There's not good churches everywhere. Oh, there might be churches everywhere, but there's not good churches everywhere. And they've had a harder time finding a good church in the area than they thought they would, even though it's a highly populated area. You, you might say, well, you know, Pastor Girl, I've been here for a while, and I'm thinking about maybe leaving, checking some things out. Can I say this? You better make sure God's in on that. You know what happened a lot? Chapter 13, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Chapter 14, he's living in Sodom. Uncle Abram comes and, and, and rescues him. You would think that that would be the wake-up call because I'm convinced whenever a child of God makes a wrong decision, God will do his, whatever he needs to do to wake them up. And I believe that was God's wake-up call when, when those kings came against the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and took them captive. And Abram with his 318 trained men went and, and, and captured and, and recaptured everything and brought them back. And they wanted to make Abram a rich man. He said, no, no, I don't want anything you've got. Nobody's going to look at me and say Sodom and Gomorrah made me rich. Chapter 18, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. And God came and talked with Abraham, and, and Abram said, God, would you spare the righteous for 50? And God said, I'll deal with that. And God, and he, God said, or he said, well, how about 45? And God said, I'll spare for 45. And he said, would you spare the city for 40? And he said, yes. And he said, 30. And he said, 20. And finally, he said, 10. And God said, yes, Abram, I'll spare the city for 10. And I've heard more than one preacher say, why didn't he keep going? Why didn't he say five? Why didn't he say two? Why didn't he say one? I wonder if Abram said 10 because he knew Lot's got more than 10 family members there. I mean, in chapter 19, verse 12, the angels said to Lot, hast thou here any besides son-in-law? He had two. And thy sons? I don't think the angels would have said thy sons if he didn't have any sons. So if he had sons, plural, that was four. Thy daughters, he had two married daughters, two single daughters, that's eight. Lot and his wife, that's 10. Not even counting any grandchildren they might have had, Lot had at least 10 Family members in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he didn't even reach his own family. Right. See, he relocated outside of the will of God, and I don't see where God ever became an important part of his life. It was all about Lot. Lot chapter, in chapter 19, he's sitting in the gate of Sodom. He became somebody. He became maybe one of the judges, one of the, one of the who's who in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. When he came to his son-in-laws and said, God's going to judge the city, he seemed as one that mocked unto them. They said, Lot, we've seen you. We've seen your testimony. We don't buy into what you're saying. We don't believe what you're telling us based on some message that God gave you through these angels. And when Lot and his wife and his two daughters left town, that means at least eight of Lot's family members were still in that city 
And I'm not excusing Lot's wife for turning around and becoming into a, turning into a pillar of salt. But when she heard the screams and that fire and brimstone falling from heaven, I can only imagine that the heart of a mother and the heart of the grand, a grandmother wasn't just turning around. I think she wanted to go back and rescue them. And it was too late. It was too late. Perhaps if he would have prayed and if he would have built an altar and perhaps if he would have made his faith personal, he might have been wise enough to stay out of Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place. Pastor Carl, what are you saying tonight? I'm saying I think if we look at Abram's father, we can learn some lessons from that. If we look at Abram's faith, we can learn some lessons from that. Young people, make your faith personal. Make it real to you. Don't, don't, don't live through your teenage years and college years saying, you know what, I, I'm just following my parents' faith. I'm just following my preacher's faith. I'm just following my teacher's faith. Could you... Get alone and get a hold of God and let God make it real to you. I grew up in a pastor's home. I was in church every Sunday morning, Sunday, Wednesday night. I've heard of these people say, oh, Pastor Cole, you don't understand. I was drugged to church on Sunday morning. I was drugged to church on Wednesday night. I was drugged to church on Sunday night. And I've said to them, you know what? I was in church. I was the first one there. We were the last ones to leave. And I'm just glad that even as a child, God just put a love for the, for the Lord's house in my heart. I never felt drugged in church at all. I love church. My dad would go to special meetings all over the state of Michigan. We were in church sometimes three and four or five times a week. My dad was an evangelist. He wasn't a special speaker. If you knew somebody was having meetings, we were there. And I'm so glad that God put a love in my heart. And I'm so glad for the day that God said, Kevin, it's time you make this personal to you. My grandfather graduated from Moody Bible Institute in 1945 was a pastor and evangelist for over 40 years. My, my, my great-grandmother was saved, and my, my grandparents on my dad's side were saved, so I'm at least a third generation on my dad's side and a fourth generation Christian on my mom's side. And so when we get together with family reunions, everybody that I've ever been with at a family reunion would claim to be saved and attended a Baptist church. But there had to come a point in time in my life where I said, this is not just my Grandpa Kroll's faith. It's not just my Grandpa Morris's faith. This is mine. And that's what Abram did. He made it personal. I see a famine that he experienced. And rather than say, God, where should I go now? He went to Egypt. And he learned that it's not just sometimes what takes you to Egypt. It's what you bring back from Egypt. I see this fear that caused him to tell a lie. And his wife was taken captive. And could have turned out a whole lot worse than it did. But his fear got his eyes off of God and got his eyes on himself. And I see this separation and I see this relocation in the, in the life of Lot. And the saddest thing that I see is that he didn't get on his knees before God and say, God, what should I do? This decision is going to affect my family, my children, no doubt my grandchildren, maybe several generations down the road. God, what decision should I make? We can make flipping decisions so quick. And oftentimes the consequences will last for years. Some simple lessons from Abram's life. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. God, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts tonight. And I pray that we would listen and apply what we've heard. Holy Spirit, I don't know the needs here tonight, but you do. And I pray that you would use the words that were said tonight and even other words that weren't said. Holy Spirit, I pray that your will be accomplished even in the invitation. For those that need an altar, God, please let them come. May not worry about who's next to them or who's around them, but may they just come and maybe they just need to come and make their faith personal to themselves tonight. Maybe they're going through a famine and they just need to say, God, I know you're testing my sincerity and my maturity. Help me to just keep moving in the right direction even while this famine is going on. God, may we look at our life and may we look at Abram's life and say, what lessons can I learn from the life of this great patriarch of the faith? Bless the invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand, please?